We often think that serving God requires a platform or a title or a following, but that's not true at all. Serving God requires a willing attitude. This is the most important thing that you can have if you're willing to do something, if you're willing to step up. You don't have to be super talented. Now, you have to be talented to sing on the worship team. I got to be honest about that, all right? So uh, they don't let me sing on the worship team. They don't want me anywhere close to that. And you thank God for that because you're better off because of that. But the fact is, the most important ability you can have as a Christian is availability. Availability. And so Scripture teaches us that we need to serve God. Now, it can be as simple as serving God with your time or your gifts and and just simply making a difference in Jesus' name. In fact, Jesus himself said this. If you'll do something as simple as give a cup of cold water in the name of Jesus, you'll receive a reward for that. Now think about the incredible grace of God that's required. You see, God's grace is unearned, unmerited, undeserved. We get it freely because of the love of God. But God not only will give us his grace, he'll give us forgiveness, he'll give us salvation for free. But if we do anything to serve him, remotely, he said, we're going to receive a reward for it. Man, that's incredible. God takes notice of our small acts of service. He takes notice when we use our resources for him. He takes notice when we invest our time for him into the kingdom of God. And let me just say this. Oftentimes around church, we use terminology that not everybody understands. Uh, we'll say things like the kingdom of God. And that sounds so spiritual, but a lot of people have no clue what that means. Now, what we mean by that is when you invest in the church, you're making a difference for eternity. When you invest your time serving God by serving others, and that's how you serve God, by the way. You don't serve God on an island. You don't serve God remotely. You serve God by serving others. And when you're able to be a part of that and you give your time serving the church, serving people through the weekend services, volunteering in children's ministry and youth ministry and whatever ministry you want to be involved in, God says you get a reward for it. God says that he blesses you for it. Now, we've got to broaden our view of serving to include our job. A lot of people don't think about that. Did you know that God wants you to serve him on the job, not just at church. I mean, it's one thing to come to church, right? It's one thing to, uh, to come in and put on the Sunday face and everybody's smiley, smiley, right? And uh, you come and you pretend like everything's great. It's another thing to serve God during the week at your job. When you had a bad night the night before, what is your attitude like at work? Uh, when you had a tough time getting to work because of traffic. What is your attitude like there? We've got to broaden our understanding of serving to include our job and our family and whatever we do. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, one of my favorite verses says this, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now, how much are we supposed to do for God's glory? All. All. Not some, not Sunday. Oh, you should do it on Sunday, but that's not where it ends. In other words, our life must be about serving God in every part of our life. Now, I want you to know that when you get involved, it makes a difference. When you get involved, it makes a difference for eternity. When you volunteer, when you give, when you serve, It makes a difference in the lives of others. I've shared this story before, but it bears repeating. It's a good story. Um, When I was in high school, I played basketball. And uh, our our high school basketball team, uh, where I grew up in North Carolina, we went together to go swimming 
in the Fisher River, there where I lived in North Carolina, there in the mountains of North Carolina. Beautiful little area. The area that we would go swimming was, was pretty deep. It went, I don't know, 15, 20 feet deep in the river. And there was this place called the Rock House. The Rock House. That sounds fun uh, just saying that. The Rock House. Now, what the Rock House was, was this sheer cliff that towered about 40 feet above the river. Now, about 10 feet up the side of that, uh, of the rock house, of that cliff, there was about a, a little ledge that was about 10 feet above the water, and you could jump off of that uh, 10 foot ledge into the water, and it was fun. It was fun jumping from the 10 foot spot. But there, through, the reason it was called the rock house was because there was a cave in the middle of this cliff. And it went from about 10 feet above the water through the rock all the way up to the top. And you could walk out to the ledge of this cliff and look down at the river 40 feet down. I see some of you are getting sick already just thinking about the heights, right? So uh, it was called the Rock House. Now, there were a lot of things that went on at the Rock House, including swimming, all right? Uh, it was a popular hangout for a lot of young people, and they did things that we shall not mention in church uh, at the Rock House. But our basketball team went to the Rock House, and man, we were having a great time. We were swimming. We were jumping off the 10-foot ledge. We were diving into the water. We were doing what, you know, teenage boys do, having fun at the river. And then all of a sudden, one of our groups said, let's crawl through the rock, through the cave, and go on top of the rock house. So we did. We got out of the water. We climbed up the 10-foot ledge. We crawled through the cave uh, to the very top, and we all got to the edge of the cliff, and we looked over. And immediately we thought, "Uh -uh. (laughs) uh-uh, I ain't doing that. That's too far down, 40 feet down to the water. And we all pretended like we were going to be brave and we were going to jump off and we would act like it and then we would chicken out. Somebody would pretend they were going to go and then they would stop. Somebody would run and they would fake somebody out. And then I'll never forget it. There was one of our team members, his name was Rodney. Rodney was known sometimes for doing and saying crazy things. And so whenever Rodney said what he said, we did not take him seriously. We just thought that was Rodney being Rodney. Because we all were up there, we were pretending that we were going to jump. Nobody had the guts to jump. Nobody was brave enough to jump. And all of a sudden, Rodney says, he kind of lifted his hand like he was in class. It was weird. He says, I'll go. I'll go. And we're like, Rodney, you're not going to go. You're just teasing. You're being Rodney. That's a Rodney thing to say because we know that you're nuts, okay? But Rodney says, no, seriously, I'll go. And so we were like, okay. So we kind of parted like the Red Sea, and we let Rodney get a running start. Now, keep in mind, it's 40 feet from the top of this cliff down to the water. So Rodney's like, I'll go. So he backs up. I don't know how far he backed up, 50, 60 feet maybe, and he gets him a running start. And we're like kind of cheering him on. We're like, at any second, Rodney is going to stop. And he got within 20 feet of the edge, and he kept on chugging. He got within 10 feet of the edge. We were like, oh, no, he's going to put on the brake soon. He's got to stop soon. He got within five feet of the edge, and we're like, oh, no, what is happening? And all of a sudden, Rodney got to the very edge of the rock house, and he jumped. And we were like, this can't be happening. This is crazy. This is too far. This is too much. Somebody's going to get hurt. And we saw Rodney, and we all ran to the ledge of the cliff, and he screamed all the way down. He's like, ah! And he went under the water. A second passed. Two seconds passed. Three seconds passed. 
four seconds passed, five seconds passed, and I thought to myself, it was good knowing you, Rodney, you were a good dude. And all of a sudden, he broke the plane of the water, and thrashing through the water, at first I thought he was hurt. At first I thought something was wrong with him, but as he broke the plane of the water, he screamed at the top of his lungs, that was awesome! And one by one, we backed up, and we got 50 feet, and 20 feet, and 10 feet, and five feet, and we jumped. And we went screaming all the way to the surface of the water, and we plunged beneath the water, and every one of us broke the plane of the water again and said, that was awesome. Now, the reason that I tell you that story is that Rodney influenced us simply by saying, I'll go. I'll do it. I'll be the one. I'll take the first step. And he he influenced an entire team because he said, I'll go. Now I want you to hear what Joshua said. He said to the nation of Israel, I'll go. I don't know what you're going to do, but my family and I are going to serve the Lord. Read with me in Joshua 24, verses 14 and 15. Now, therefore, the fear of the Lord, uh, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Serve the Lord. The Lord. That, that's the call for us, right? That's the call to you and to me to get involved, to step in, to step up, to serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, in other words, if you don't want to do it, if you think it's too much, if you think it's too far, if you think it's too crazy to do that, he says, if this is what you think, that it's something that you ought not to do, He said, then choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. And here's Joshua's I'll go moment. He's speaking to the entire nation of Israel. And he says, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Just like that basketball team on top of the rock house, somebody had to go. Somebody had to be first. Somebody had to say, I'll go, I'll go. And as a result of that, an entire nation followed God and began to serve him. I want to read you that last sentence from the message paraphrase. Here's what it says. So now, fear God and worship him in total commitment. You know what God's looking for? He's looking for some men and women, not who are perfect. That's not what he expects. That's why we say at Avalon Church, it's the perfect place for imperfect people. You're not perfect. You've had sin. You've had failure in your past. You've done some things that you don't want anybody to know about, but God's called you. God saved you. God's changed you. You may not be everything you ought to be, but thank God you're not what you used to be. And you know what God wants? He wants some total commitment from you. You don't have to be perfect, but you do have to be available. You do have to be committed. You do have to say, just like Rodney said, I'll go. I'll go. I'll go. The word fear here does not mean to cower in fear like you're afraid of a snake or a monster. It means to worship and to stand in awe. In the Good News translation, it's translated this way, honor the Lord. Let me ask you this question. What are you using to honor the Lord with your life? And I'm not talking about just coming to church. That's for you. How are you honoring, honoring God? Are you honoring, with your, honoring Him with your time? your talent, your resources? 
How are you making a difference? Are you so busy living in this world, you have forgotten that there is an eternity that is a whole lot longer than what time we have here on this planet? There is something far more important than your job. I'm not saying your job's not important. It's very important. But are you honoring the Lord? How are you doing that? Uh, in um, the New Century Version, here's how it reads. It says, respect the Lord. Do you know what the height of disrespect is? To receive a gift from God. He, think of the gifts he's given you. He's given you life. That's undeniable. You are sitting in this room today because God has allowed you to breathe another day. Okay? Uh, he, is, he has given you Jesus. Now think about the incredible nature of that. He's given you forgiveness. He's given you his grace. He's given you the free gift of salvation. And on top of that, he's given you the talent that you have. I don't know if you know this, but God has never leaned over the balcony of heaven and went, oh my goodness, did you see her sing? I did not know that she was that good. He's never leaned over the balcony of heaven and been impressed by anything that any of us has ever done. Not once. Nothing takes God by surprise. He gave you the very talent that you have. Now, some of you are like, well, I don't have the talent that so-and-so has. Well, that's great. You know why? Because God created you to be you. He created you as an individual, and he's given you exactly what he wants you to have. Do you know the height of disrespect is to receive all of these gifts from God? Life, breath, talent, time, resources, and not ever respect them. Not ever honor him. Not ever worship him by serving the Lord. Now, I wonder sometimes, and I'm not trying to make you feel bad, but I wonder what God thinks sometimes about many of us as Christians. We'll go to church when we feel like it. It's convenient. And, you know, we go with a consumer mentality. You know what we do? We're like, as long as I like the music, as long as I like the programming, as long as I like the pastor and he doesn't preach too long, then I'm going to go to church. But otherwise, I mean, <laughs> you know, you just count me out otherwise. I, I wonder what God thinks sometimes about our commitment. You know what God's looking for? He's looking for somebody to say, I'll go. He's looking for somebody that will step up and somebody that will step in and begin to honor him. Let, let me read it to you this way. Romans 12, 1 and 2. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice. By the way, that's an oxymoron. A living death. Living sacrifice. A sacrifice is something that dies, Okay. And so God's saying, you live by dying to self. You live by dying to your own whims and desires. Not that God does not give you a personality and desires and love for a reason. He does, okay? But listen closely. God wants me to be a living sacrifice. In other words, he wants me to say, God, whatever you want with my life, that's what I want. However you want me to serve you, that's how I'll serve you. He said, be a living sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Now, don't get me wrong. I think music is an incredibly important part of church. I think it's an incredibly important part of the Christian life. In fact, there's a whole entire book of the Bible that is nothing but songs, the book of Psalms. So it's very important. But God is not looking necessarily for more people just to get goosebumps during the worship time in church. Now, I think you should do that. You know, look, whatever, you know, whatever 
uh, ability you have, whatever your personality is like. I know some of you like, you, you, you wave your hands and you're all excited. And some of you have your hands in your pocket the whole time because you're afraid that you might accidentally have a hand go up. Like, you know, uh, somebody might laugh at me, right? Whatever your personality is, it doesn't matter. The point is this. God says the way you worship him, the way you truly worship him is to let your body, your life, your time, your talent, your resources be a living sacrifice. That's what he wants. He's looking for yes men and yes women. He's looking for somebody that will say, I'll go. I'm here. God, I may not be much, but what I have, I'm going to give to you. That's what he wants. He says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. You know how a person thinks before they're transformed? They think that all of their time, all of their talent, all of their resources, all of their opportunity, it's all about you. It's all about you. But when you become a follower of Christ and you truly begin to worship him, you know what God says? He will transform the way you think. And all of a sudden, you stop thinking about you so much and you start thinking about others. And when you're able to do that, he says, then you will learn to know what God's will is for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. You know what God's looking for? He's looking for people that will step up. Here's what we want to see. Uh, Three things, very quickly. Serving is an act of worship. It's an act of worship. When you serve God, according to Scripture we just read, you are worshiping Him. Um, We respond to the goodness of God not just with our words, not just with our songs, not just with our time, not just with our presence, but with our talent. And so what God wants us to do is understand that when I serve God, it is an act of worship. The church that I grew up in, in North Carolina, it was a big old country church. And I've told you stories of a lot of interesting people that were in that church. Uh, One woman that nobody really knew very much, her name was Alma, A-L-M-A, Alma. Alma, I never heard her say, I don't know if I've ever even heard her speak. I mean, I'm assuming she could speak. Um, you know, she was married. I'm assuming she spoke to her husband. Um, but I, I did know that even though I didn't hear her speak, she never got on stage. She never sang. She never led a group of any kind. You know what she did every week of her life? She would come to that church and she would volunteer. You know how she served? She wasn't a singer. She wasn't a preacher. You know what she did? She cleaned the church. Every single week, you could see Alma there, and she'd be putting in her time. She'd clean the bathrooms, and she'd clean the lobby, and she'd clean the auditorium, and she'd clean the pews, and, and all of this. And I began to understand as I got older that Alma, you know what she was doing? She was worshiping God. She was worshiping God. And she's not alive today. But you know, when we get to heaven, you know, I really do believe there are going to be a lot of preachers that you saw on television maybe, or maybe they were well-known, or they had a lot of people that followed them. And we're going to be surprised that when we get to heaven, who gets the biggest rewards? I don't believe it's going to be those guys. I don't believe it's going to be me. Now, I've served God with my life. I've done everything I could, and I've tried to follow the Lord. But you know who I believe is going to be way, 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 way in front of the line? The Almas of the world. She gave what she had. And she said, I'll go. I'll go. I'll step in. I'll step up. Serving is an act of worship. Serving is also a choice. I love what Joshua said to the nation of Israel. He said, choose today who you're going to serve. Choose what you're going to do. Make a choice. It is a choice. You've got to decide whether you're going to serve God or counterfeit God. You ever notice that we tend, and we don't think of it this way, but a lot of times we serve counterfeit gods, the, the counterfeit God of money. 
the counterfeit God of pleasure. Now, God created pleasure, and pleasure is from God, but pleasure is to be done in the honor and the glory of God. Just because you say, well, you know, I get a lot of pleasure out of getting slammed drunk and uh, doing body shots at the bar after work. Eh, maybe that's not the kind of pleasure that God's looking for. But I do know this, that it's a choice to serve God or a counterfeit God. I get to choose. I get to choose my attitude. I love the attitude of so many of the volunteers, the leaders here at this church. You know what they do? They have a great attitude. They got a smile on their face. And I know for a fact, listen, I know for a fact that not all of them have a great 24 hours in the past 24 hours. I know a lot of them have pain in their life. I know a lot of them have had trouble in their life. Boy, I love their attitude. You know why? You get to choose that. You get to choose what kind of attitude you have. Uh, you get to choose to be on time. I know this is not in the text, but uh, let me just kind of give you just a personal thought here. When you serve God, it's worth being on time. It's worth being on time. How many of you, let me just kind of take a survey. When you go to a movie, you have to see the previews as well. Raise your hand. Anybody? How many of you are okay with coming in after the previews have already started? I do not like any of you, all right? So, because you screw it up for me. I, I want to see the previews. I think if it's worth going to, it's worth being on time. If it's worth serving God, it's worth being on time. It's worth having a good attitude. It's worth being prepared. It's worth following the leadership. It's worth helping others. Um, several years ago, uh, there was a, a woman here in our church that served in our guest services. And you know, I know that some people think, well, you know, that, that was not as important as some of the others. That, I disagree with that. The first impression that a lost person gets is going to begin in the parking lot, not during the music, not during the preaching. The first impression they get is going to be from somebody that smiles at them and welcomes them and greets them. We had a young woman in our church. She served on our guest services team, and there was a man that came, and she noticed he was kind of alone, kind of kept to himself, and she deliberately, on purpose, she did her job, she went up and greeted him, and she began to talk with him, and she found out about him. She was asking him questions and just letting him know that he was important, that we were so glad that he was a part of Avalon Church. That man got saved that day. And afterwards, listen, he told us. He moved uh, not too long after that. He told us this story. He said, on that day that I came to church at Avalon for the first time, I determined that I was going to give it one more shot. I was going to give God one more chance. I was going to give the church one more chance. And if it did not go well, I was going to go home and commit suicide. My life, he said, was so painful. And it just wasn't worth living. And he said, somebody at that church cared for me. And it made him feel like he mattered to God. And on that day, his eternal destiny was changed. Why? Because somebody said, I'll go. I'll be the one. I'll say yes. Very important. We get to choose whether or not we serve. And then finally, serving is a family affair. And I love what Joshua said. He said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Joshua brought his family with him. Can I just challenge you, bring your kids, serve with them. Did you know that surveys and studies show that the families who serve together with their children, that the majority of the time, 95% of the time, those children never stop going to church. And I realize that some of these statistics are probably a little skewed in a pandemic, I get that. But the point is still there that you and I need to come with our family. Can I just lovingly encourage the parents here today? Do not, do not 
do not leave it up to your kids whether or not they're going to go to church. You say, well, I don't want to force religion down their throat. You force broccoli down their throat, don't you? God knows somebody has to force it down mine or I won't eat it, right? But we don't have that attitude about school. We don't have that attitude about any other area of life. Now, once again, do they have to make their own choices? Yes. And like the old adage, this is not scripture, but it's a, it's a pretty good thought. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink, right? You can take your kids to church, and then where it's true that you cannot have a relationship with God for them. But let me just tell you, you got a whole lot better ch- shot of them having a relationship with God when you bring them than if you leave them. Make sure your kids are involved in Avalon Kids. We don't do that. We got some of the most wonderful volunteers in the world, and we teach the Word of God. And it's important that you bring your family with you. Joshua said it's for me and my house. We're going to serve the Lord. Make sure your teenagers, your middle school and high schoolers, and I know that some of you have your middle schoolers here on Sunday morning, but maybe not Wednesday night. Make sure they're here on Wednesday night too. I'm telling you, it makes a difference. Joshua said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Psalm 78, 4, we will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power, and about his mighty works. Tell the next generation. Let your kids see it in you. You say, well, I'm not perfect. All the more reason to bring them to church. They don't expect perfection. In fact, if you pretend to be perfect, they pretty much know what goes on behind the scenes. They know you're lying. So they're not expecting perfection. You know what they do want? Authenticity. They want something that's real. And you can give that to them. And I want to encourage you today to do what Rodney did and to say, I'll go. There are people watching you, young people, children, teenagers, adults, friends. They're looking at your life, and you can have an impact in their life. I'll go. I'll go. I'll go. As a 16-year-old boy, I said that to God for probably the first time in my life. I knew God was dealing with me about my life. He was dealing with me about my future. And I, you know what? You can talk about call to ministry, but you know what I did? I volunteered. I simply said to God, I'll go. Will you? Will you step up? Will you step in? That is my prayer for you today. Thanks so much for joining us today on the Avalon Church YouTube channel. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision of Avalon Church, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.